with our first speaker, Brian Smithers. And I guess I should tell you I'm going to do really short biographies because all these people live on the Google. So if you want to find out about them, you know where to find them. Uh, uh, Brian is a, uh, uh, is a graduate student at, at um, UC Davis uh, in the ecology program, and he uh, works on tree line response to climate change and the basin and range mountains. He's also been very involved in the International Glory Project. Thanks for being here, Brian. Turnout. I'm, I'm going to assume you all showed up early for Stu's talk uh, and get, get mine in the interim, which is great. We'll be talking today about uh, some tree line changes that are going on in the White Mountains. This is uh, my PhD work, and it's, it's sort of brand new. So, I'm going to be sort of giving the, the what's going on qualitatively, and then give you just a little nibble of, of the data that I've been able to look at so far. The thing about tree line is uh, it's, it's definitely not a line. So the, the word itself is, is a real problem. Uh, it's really a really sloppy ecotone between subalpine forest and the alpine world. Uh, Kerner gives us a good uh, indicator that we can at least define it by saying it's where the trees stop. And he, he even goes so far as to say it's where uh, that a tree is anything taller than three meters. And so that's, I, I use that definition. And so we actually can draw a bit of a line. Um, tree line is temperature regulated very tightly, and this is a worldwide phenomenon. You see the same relationship with temperature anywhere in the world where there is a climatic tree line, which means it ought to be a good indicator of climate change effects on vegetation, something we're sort of lacking in right now where we talk about what might happen or what's going to happen, what is projected, that we ought to be able to see these changes now uh, in response to climate change. The problem is we're not seeing it in a lot of places. A paper in 2009 showed that in looking at, gosh, I can't remember how many, it was a lot of tree line studies, but almost half of those were showing no response to, to climate change, no, no advancement or upslope migration of tree line. And they, they, a lot of reasons were presented for this, uh, some of those human caused, some of those because the mountains uh, are, are typically in areas where you've got glaciation, you might run into cliffs where there's no room to go, but there are a lot of, of places where tree line just isn't moving up. And the Sierra Nevada happens to be one of those. Uh, this is Crystal Long's work um, showing that in the Sierra Nevada, that in, in his paper in 2013, that tree line wasn't really advancing, uh, but that they were sh what he was able to show was a, a significant increase in density of subalpine trees in the subalpine forest, and that's what we're looking at here, is in the modern plots we're seeing in this smaller size class, we're seeing a, 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 an increase over historic plots in stem density. Uh, which, which brings me to, to my question, uh, one, can we find somewhere in California where tree light is advancing, and if we can do that, um, can we start to look at how that is happening, uh, specifically how, do, how are the species moving up? And, uh, you know, you can think about this sort of in, in the most simplistic terms of what we might expect. Let's say we've got this tree line here, and we can say we've got some arbitrary species A, which is our tree line species, and some other species B, which grows down slope. Then if we had some advance of tree line, we might just expect species A and species B to move up in response to climate change, right? That would be the, the expectation. And then maybe some species C moves from even further down slope. Uh, in order to take a look at this, we, we want some, some things met so that we don't fall into one of those tree line studies where we're not able to see that tree line advance, such as we've seen some documented tree, uh, temperature increases, minimal human disturbance, etc. cetera. Uh, and what would be really nice is to have a nice simple system of just a few species so that we can try to parse out what's going on and uh, if you are you know, really thinking with your head screwed on, you might notice that that's a picture of the White Mountains there, which is, of course, the, the title of this talk, and where, uh, where I'm looking at this, where we can meet a lot of these ideal study systems for looking at tree line advance. 
The White Mountains as recently uh, as 50 years ago were thought to harbor a relict forest, uh, trees that were on their way out. Uh, they were sort of an evolutionary dead end according to, to Billings and Thompson. They're not reproducing. Uh, Shulman, who discovered the oldest uh, known bristlecone pine, uh, called them a relic species doomed to extinction. And even as recently as 2011, the IUCN was, uh, had bristlecone pine on their red list because they were not regenerating. Uh, take a look at that photo in 1960, now take a look at 2013, uh, just to show these sort of errant thoughts that go into um, th thinking about, uh, or trying to make statements about trees that grow f for 5,000 years on a 50-year time scale. But in 1960, it was clear that no regeneration had been happening in these forests for quite a while, and that really it's just in the last 50 years that we've started to see this regeneration. Uh, just another example of that, take a look at this area specifically. This is a, a tree line site. Um, you can really see that infill happening in a pretty short amount of time. Can we document temperature increases in the whites? We can. This is work out of Connie Millar's lab. Uh, Connie and Bob Westfall have done these temperature reconstructions using a variety of inputs. Uh, and what, what we notice is that the actual maximum temperature has stayed pretty, it's a lot of vari variation over the last uh, 100 years or so, but the, it stayed relatively constant. But what we do get is a, is a very clear increase in the annual minimum temperature, especially from 1980 onward. And that's where we're actually seeing a lot of these, in Connie's work, where we're seeing a lot of these pulses of limber pine regeneration. So our two species of, of um, our, our ideal simple system does just have two species, which is nice, limber pine and bristlecone pine. <laughs> Uh, according to published uh, temp, uh, ranges, they, they both sort of uh, overlap. But what we mostly see actually in the whites is that bristlecone pine is our tree line species, and liver pine typically grows further down the slope. Um, just a couple of other factoids on there. There are some really clear soil differences where these two species, where you find the majority of these two species. Um, specifically with liver pine, you see them a lot of granitic soils. And uh, with bristlecone pine, they're, they're largely relegated to dolomite soils as adults. We're going to call that into question in just a little bit. Um, the soil, last sort of piece we need to, to, sort of, to sort of know, there are three main soil types in the White Mountains at tree line. Uh, granitic soil is very porous, um, more or less nutrient poor, but really just has a terrible water holding capacity, so it's a very dry soil. Quartzite soil, which is a dark soil, which gets actually surprisingly very hot in the summertime, uh, which can also cause drying problems. And then dolomitic soil, which is um, the sedimentary, sedimentary carbonate rock. It's full of nasty stuff that plants don't like, uh, except for bristlecone pine, which uh, you can see here. This, this photo actually has all three soil types in it. This is, um, these are granitic boulders here, bristlecone pine growing on dolomite, and then this is all Campedo quartzite in the background. And you can see we've got very sharp delineations of where, uh, where these species grow. Okay, so in order to get these questions of is tree line advancing, and if so, how, I put in a series of plots, uh, 30 by 10 meter, uh, sort of modified belt transects across, across uh, upper tree line and then also mid stand, trying to follow the actual contours of the mid stand and upper tree line. And in each of those, identifying uh, the tree species to species, and flip a coin, kind of, uh, they're just the two of them. Uh, and then we use these world counts to age them approximately. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I feel very confident of, of trees less than 15 years of age of getting it right. Above then, you've got you know, some flub room of a couple of years. But we can at least bend them into 10-year categories to get some ideas to how old these are. And then I'm also collecting a host of association data with those plots, obviously. And then this part's really important, uh, collecting, using basal area estimates as a proxy for seed source in those plots. So, um, you know, if we've got a, a lot of adult bristlecone pine, we would, we would expect some sort of, uh, we would expect a lot more seed source coming from bristlecone pine, obviously. So, just some, some methods here then. Uh, is tree line advancing? Yes. Uh, we, we're, we're showing a, a clear advance upslope. Uh, over all of my uh, plots, which we have 204 of those over nine sites, all three soil types, um, we're getting a, an average of about 20 meters of upslope um, migration. 
we're getting a pretty clear significant soil effects, specifically with granite uh, showing really, uh, really strong upslope advancement and being as much as 200 meters upslope, which is actually this photo right here showing that. Um, that uh, we've got adult trees way down here, and then a gradation of juveniles that, that goes you know, all the way up to here. So 200 vertical meters is quite a, quite a jump. And then those models, I can't really get anything else significant besides elevation and, uh, and soil type in those. It's moving up, the point being, it's moving up everywhere. So then we get to sort of the, the, uh, the interesting parts of, of how this is happening. And um, the, the, this is just showing our, our basal area, and it shows exactly what we might expect. Bristlecone pine basal area at above tree line, that upper tree line really means actually above tree line, uh, is much higher than that for limber pine. We know that bristlecone pine is the tree line species, we would expect that. When we go mid stand, uh, the, the trend is, is uh, more or less the same, but we have a more equal seed source. Remember, this basal area is a seed source proxy. So that makes sense. That's what we would expect. What we wouldn't expect is that the stem density of juveniles looks nothing like our seed source. And what we're finding is that the tree line advance is largely limber pine. And that bristlecone pine isn't making the, the, the move up, at least you know, in, the, in, in the near term. This is for sure true uh, above tree line. Uh, Mid-stand sort of looks like what we would expect. These are, these are insignificant. Uh, it's, it's pretty much 50-50 mid-stand. So we know that bristlecone pine is regenerating normally uh, mid-stand. The question is, why is it not also uh, regenerating above tree line? So this, and, and then this data is, is biased because, if you remember from before, limber pine is, uh, granite soils are dominated by limber pine. And this includes limber pine sites. If we take away those and just look at dolomite sites, these are bristlecone pine sites, where you, we don't even find limber pine adults as evidenced by this basal area. We, we've got just a smattering of limber pine, totally dominated by bristlecone pine. And we actually have a greater difference in the stem density on dolomite soil, which as of 10 years ago, you would say, oh, limber pine, they can't grow on dolomite. Really clear, and, and a, a similar, you know, even in mid-stand where there are no limber pine uh, adults, we're seeing a, quite a bit of limber pine regeneration. So back to our, our little caricature here. This is our, our tree line. Now we've put, uh, you know, bristlecone pine and limber pine to A and B. We've got our tree line advance. What we're seeing, instead of everybody just moving up, is limber pine actually leapfrogging over bristlecone pine. Now, that's, that's interesting scientifically, but then we start to, to, or at least I start to get concerned, because we also have a third species, pinion pine, which is sort of poised to move up, and there's, I'm not working, I, I hope to, to work on this in the near future, but I, I'm not yet. Uh, it looks like pinion pine is also moving up. And then, what, what do you get when you run out of real estate upslope, because this is a temperature re regulated thing, and you've got a better competitor moving upslope, it starts to look like bristlecone pine is getting pinched out. This could just be a temporary situation, right? These are trees that live for 5,000 years, or can live to 5,000 years, uh, and, I'm, and I'm looking at this on a, on a human time scale, but these trees haven't really seen climate change that happens this quickly, maybe ever. So it's, I'm concerned. I think we ought to be concerned. I'm not sure what to do about it, but I think it's of concern. So just by way of conclusion, we, we know that tree line is advancing now. We can, we can document that. Tree line advance is largely due to limber pine, not bristlecone pine moving up. And this is, this is the really cool part, which is, is kind of the rest of my, of my thesis, is that limber pine seed source seems to be coming from somewhere else entirely, especially on dolomite soils. It's coming from, must be coming from quite a distance. Um, and so, kind of what's next, what I'm looking at, tree ring analysis, is, is this jump of limber pine, is this just a temporary flash in the pan thing, or can we look historically to try to find whether limber pine has, uh, kind of what the range of conditions limber pine has survived through, and can we make some predictions of what it might live through in the future based on that. Uh, I've, got some, I've got a host of common gardens planted all over the place to see how these two uh, 
respond at the at the establishment or, or germination and establishment phase. Um, doing some liver uh, liver pine soil preference experiments to see just how well it does in one spot on these three soil types. So looking at some drought tolerance, and I'm also doing some genetics to see if we can get at some of these um, dispersal questions through population genetic structure. Uh, and it'll largely come down to this little character right there, the Clark's Nutcracker, which is a big time dis disperser of limber pine seed versus Ursico, which is a winged seed. I think that factors into it largely how is, is, is sort of the, the remaining question. So with that, uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank um, my, my lab at UC Davis, also Connie Millar and Bob Westfall at <coughs> Forest Service has been a huge help in Hugh Safford. Adelia, um, who's uh, I'm sort of following on her heels uh, in the White Mountains. I'm uh, deeply saddened that she's not here with us today. And then a host of uh, funding sources, not least of which, of course, is the California Native Plant Society. So with that, I think I uh, have plenty of time for questions. I hope, right? Thank you. Before, yeah, take, you've got your hand up. Before yeah. you finish, it's great. So a lot of examples, supposedly, of crystal pine, cone pine moving on slope is that the patriarch grows. Is that an anomaly? Is that supposed to supposedly do the climate change for some people? Yeah, Patriarch Grove is one of my is one of my sites, so that's included in this data. Um, Could you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. The question uh, he asked about a specific site, the Patriarch Grove, which is a, a place I'm sure many of us have been to that has uh, doc that you can see from the road, uh, small trees moving up. Those are mostly limber pine that you're looking at that move up there. Yeah, it's, it's shocking. You see all the adult bristlecone pine, so you assume that what you're looking at are, are uh, baby bristlecone pine. It is, turns out to not be the case. Yep, it's, it's surprising. Yes, sir. Are limber pine seeds significantly larger than those of uh, bristlecone? Yes. Uh, establishment? They are significantly larger, which is why they're targeted. Uh, the question is, are, are limber pine seeds larger than bristlecone pine, and does that have something to do with their dispersal? They are much larger, which is certainly why uh, Clark's Nutcracker targets them specifically. They're, they also will eat bristlecone pine, which means they'll, what they're doing is caching at great distance and then forgetting about some of them so they germinate. Uh, size certainly has something to do with that because of Clark's Nutcracker, not necessarily because of any other, you know, functional. Uh, I was really, uh, if, with a big seed, wouldn't that help uh, to establish that in the experiment uh, uh, above?